In a Manner of Speaking, a monthly podcast by Paul Meyer on the spoken word. Episode 3, April 2018, The Speech of Indigenous Peoples. Hi there, this is Paul. Joining me to talk about this topic is Professor Eric Armstrong of the University of York in Toronto. He teaches voice, speech, accents, dialects, and text there. He's taught in university programs in both the U.S. and Canada for the last 22 years. He and I have collaborated and co-authored various articles and projects. Most well-known are the interactive charts of the International Phonetic Alphabet. Eric did the design, the graphics, and I voiced the IPA. He's also worked with me from the beginning on the International Dialects of English Archive, which I founded and which I direct. We've co-authored articles for the Voice and Speech Review. His professional practice focuses on accent coaching, design, with numerous credits on award-winning productions for theatre, television and film. His research interests lie in the pedagogy of accent training for diverse populations, and his current project, funded by Canada's Social Science and Humanities Research Council focuses on working with Indigenous performers. My second guest is Sarah Lise MacArthur, a mixed-race Canadian actress from Saskatchewan. Her father is a Cineboy, or Nakota. She began acting at the age of 12 in the CBC miniseries Revenge of the Land, directed by John N. Smith. She then went on to study musical theatre at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York. In 2006, she moved back to Canadian soil to live in Vancouver, where she was cast in another John N. Smith miniseries called The Englishman's Boy, based on the experience of her Nakoda ancestors. And then she went to London to study acting at the East 15 Acting School at the University of Essex. She's now back in L.A., and most recently Toronto cast in Hardcore Logo 2, shown at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. Currently working with CBC once again on a new series, Arctic Air. Eric and I were fortunate enough to catch up with Sarah Lise as she was uh, on location preparing for an audition, hence the rather non-studio sound of our conversation with Sarah Lise. So, Sarah Lise, as a Canadian of mixed race and having mm-hmm. one, one foot in the mainstream television and film industry and another foot in the indigenous theatre and film world, what would you say are the spoken word issues you most frequently think about or encounter? Well, um, actually, I'll say the most difficult, challenging slash annoying one is when casting directors and producers and directors expect that you should be able to pronounce properly and or be fluent in any native dialect just because you're indigenous. They give you very little time and very little resources to complete these tasks of presenting an audition or um, some sort of material in a native dialect that is rarely spoken, and if it is spoken, may or may not be a written language, and may or may not be and likely isn't the language that your people speak. And if your people speak it, if you're over the age of or under the age of forty, there is a very low, 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 low chance that you have any sort of fluency in it whatsoever. Are there the equivalents of Eric and me? You know, white, white guys who are dialect coaches. Are there uh, first peoples, indigenous language coaches who can work in the film industry there are, and help you? But, yeah, there are, but um, they don't really work in the film industry. That's the thing. They're, they're very separate. I have, as I like to put it, I have an elder on speed dial, and he is a Cinnaboyan, which is the American way of saying Nakoda, which is what my background is on my dad's side and he luckily will you know take the time to and he works he works at a university and he can he knows how to write things phonetically and to coach very clearly he lives in the u.s like so this this takes a lot of effort i have to call like 
I forget what state he lives in, but it's not, you know, it's nowhere even near where I grew up because where I grew up, the people that speak Nakota are elders and they don't read and write in English and they're very cautious about having their voice recorded and it just doesn't go, um, it doesn't jive well with the traditional belief systems that they may or may not have and likely if they speak the language they do have. I understand. Uh, but you have had the privilege, I, I have read in your, in your biography, of, of representing Nakoda on film. Tell us about that. I had realized from talking to my dad and doing a bit of research that the Indians in, in The Englishman's Boy that are depicted in that story were Assiniboine or Nakoda. And they're from like Saskatchewan, Alberta area. So I said, like, you know, I, I, ha like, I have access to different cultural, uh, like, this is basically, this is my people that we'd be re re representing in this story. And so then with the help of my dad, I got in touch with an elder and a linguist, two separate people, and I got coached on how to say certain things. Now, originally my part didn't have any lines written, and then the director decided, you know, there's no reason she wouldn't speak. She just wouldn't speak in English. So if you can think of things that she might say when she's in these scenes and you can get them translated, then you can say them in the, in the film. So I basically then got to pen my own lines with approval, but they approved everything and then had to go about finding people to teach me that involved speaking to a linguist on the phone, getting her to send me a PDF breakdown of the phonetics of what I was saying and what, the, what it meant, and then going to an elder in Saskatchewan in, on the reserve and talking to her in person and getting coached on it. Let's listen now to a clip from one of your scenes in The Englishman's Boy. No need to fear. Rest easy. We're, we're just out for a, a stroll after church. Showing off our uh, our Sunday bonnets. <laughs> You've been picking berries, eh? Give old Grace a taste. Old Grace has sure got a sweet tooth. <laughs> you need the cubby. Ribazoka, you kakiana. You got to give her something in trade. Well, what have I got to offer? I mean, Indian girls usually prefer looking glasses and shiny whatnots. <laughs> It's pretty. Uh, some berries. Much obliged. Lord, that is the first time I ever seen Corton by sign language. That's absolutely wonderful. I understand that since then you've been able to capitalize on that opportunity, that experience, right? Since then, I've been able to learn Assiniboine Nakoda for several auditions, and there's one other short film that is almost finished that I spoke it in. I've had more exposure to it, so now my ear catches on more easily to the language, and um, it's very similar to other Siouan languages like Lakota, Dakota, and even Osage. So when I see root words that, or hear them, I can kind of pick things out now. So that, that's been a fortunate experience for me in my life, and I hope that it continues to deepen. Can I just interject for a second, Paul? Sure. Uh, Sarah Elise, have you uh, had the opportunity to do other languages that you don't have a connection to, a personal connection to? Yeah, so I was able to do Cree. And now I would say I don't have um, a blood connection to it, but I grew up in Saskatchewan and we were learning Plains Cree in this play. And uh, I only learned a few things, a few phrases, but I was able to do that and catch on to that a little bit. And just being in the pan indigenous arts community, um, I've gotten a lot of exposure to different different languages, but only in little bits here and there. But, you know, I, one of my favorite things is to think about how many different ways I know how to say thank you. 
And I know quite a few different na- ways to say thank you. I can say thank you in Nakota, Dakota, Lakota. I can say thank you in Cree, Ojibwe, Mohawk, and Coast Salish. How will I thank you in Nakota when it comes time for you to leave us today? Pinamaya. Pinamaya. Mm-hmm. I'll try to remember that. Eric, if I forget, <laughs> I'm counting on you. Pinamaya. Pinamaya, yeah. <laughs> Sarah Lisa, I have a story to tell you. Some years ago, I was asked to direct a cast of Native Americans. I live in Lawrence, Kansas, where Haskell Indian University is located, and I was asked to direct a cast of Native Americans in a telling of their own stories for a documentary. And it's it's to my shame that I found myself directing them in European rhetorical terms, in terms of jazzing up, being more expressive, being, you know, punching keywords, doing all the things that white actors are frequently asked to do to, to make, make a, a performance more interesting. And it was only later that I realized that this went against the rhetorical traditions of the, of the young actors. And I'm, I'm sure you've been directed yourself in a way that's contrary to your own Nakoda traditions of, of modesty and understatement and not putting yourself in front of the story. What, what's your experience in that realm? I'd say for the most part, whenever... I, I think I've had it pretty lucky. Like, I've been involved in uh, productions that had great sensitivity to that. And in some ways, I could... I mean, they consider it lucky or they just let me do it. <laughs> They defer to, to my knowledge, which I don't even really have as much experience as, as I'd like to be able to, to represent. But, I, yeah, I've had, I've had it pretty good in that way. I have had it where, you know, that, that can happen a lot, I think, with, like, cultural differences. And there's a, a large movement to decolonize You can only do that to a certain extent, right? Because the thing that brings that the why native people today can even speak to each other is because we all speak English, which is colonized. And then if we want to do theater, like the theaters that we work in generally are all from the colonizing cultures uh, creation, you know, like we can, we can reclaim the spaces or change the spaces, um, and change the way in which things are viewed or experienced. But in order for these stories to hit home, you have to be able to communicate them to a modern audience, whether they're indigenous or non-indigenous. So sometimes I think for me, like I would sacrifice a bit of the authenticity in order to gain effectiveness. Yeah, there's little things like, like I remember one time the way one of my cast members was saying a line, our Caucasian director was like, why did you say it like that? And he almost was laughing at him. And it's like, oh, because that's how people talk. Like that's the like Mohawk accent. So even though I'm speaking English, I'm, I have like an accent when I'm talking you know, because they're from the reservation and that's the kind of, that's the emphasis that they would have. Sure. Eric, when you and I spoke last week, you talked about that issue of reservation speech. Yeah, one one of the things, the topics we discussed on the focus groups that we led with uh, um, the actors we uh, worked with on our, our accent project uh, was this idea of sort of a kind of res speech, uh, sometimes they called it sweet grass speech, uh, a kind of almost a generic uh, indigenous accent that actors use, frequently something that they've picked up um, for younger actors that they've picked up from um, their family, their parents or their grandparents. Uh, and it's it serves as a kind of a shortcut sometimes. Um, and uh, that because it's more about the the melody, the intonation pattern, the rhythm, that it is something that is often shared across cultures. And that that might in part be due to the uh, residential school system where uh, children were torn away from their families and uh, put into this melting pot, uh, linguistic melting pot, 
which uh, may have added to kind of a, a, a quality that, at least to outsiders, is perceived as kind of pan-indigenous, that everybody sort of sounds the same. Though, if you are from a specific cultural group, you can pick out the aspects that are unique to your group. Um, the things that hold everything together, I think everybody can spot those. Sarah, Lisa, do you have any sense of that in your own work, having to kind of pull out an accent out of nowhere and so you just rely on that kind of res speech? Yes, and I will say that it does differ from region to region slightly. It is also a personalized thing, you know, especially in a place like Toronto, you have indigenous artists from all over the country and it kind of blends together. And, you know, the way Glenn Gould sounds, who's Mi'kmaq, is different than the way Brandon Oaks sounds, who's, who's Mohawk, is different than the way my family sounds from being from the Plains. So if you kind of have that res sound, if you will, it's acceptable for any nation that you might be depicting if it's modern, you know? So at least um, would, it, would it be insulting or perhaps even impossible for you to lapse into that res speech i would i would actually like for me i have to i have to access it by remembering something that my cousins used to say or something when i was younger or just like like a, something they would say they'd be like "Hole, ever cheeky raven jeez get over here and like i don't know just stuff like that so once you get the lilt going then you can just keep talking like that and the other day i was going to the mall and these guys were talking to me and I, you know, I could have swore one of them was my cousin. And sure enough, I got his phone number. He lives at my sister's house. He's my cousin. I haven't seen him for like 20 years. Can you um, speak a little in Nakoda for us? Sure. Translation? Okay, so the first one meant don't eat too many Saskatoons or your stomach will really hurt. <laughs> um, and the second one means I am Nakota. I cherish my Nakota traditions. My relatives be brave, my relatives be strong. Thank you so much. Eric, do you think this might be a good place to, uh, good place to say thank you and to let Sarah Lee go? <laughs> Sure. But, you, but you have to say, you have to remember how to say thank you in Nakota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pinamaya. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you well, so Pinamaya, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Sarah Lise. Thanks so much, Eric, for suggesting that we speak with Sarah Lise. As a white professor, dialect coach, uh, what attracted you to the world of the First Nations, the indigenous people of Canada? I had the great good fortune of working with indigenous students uh, at my university and I really felt like I was inadequately trained to deal with uh, indigenous performers. I didn't know enough about their cultural background, their linguistic background and essentially what I was handing them was the same kind of materials, the same kind of resources, the same. I personally had the same goals that I would have for any settler student or any student from an immigrant family. The reality is that the indigenous students that I have worked with, once they've graduated, they go on to work not only in mainstream film, television, and theater, but also in theater specifically targeting indigenous audiences. It becomes quite a large central focus of their careers, not exclusively, um, but frequently it is uh, a, a big part of the work that they take on. Seeing the work that they've had to create for themselves and the resources that they've had to find for themselves, I feel very passionately that I need to be able to give them better resources to support them better. I was moved to some degree by the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their calls for action. And those were primarily around language, language preservation and education. You know, I don't have the wherewithal to train students to speak 500 different languages, but it, it really did sit with me that many of my students are called upon to speak languages that they don't speak. That's another thought that I have is that 
not only should I be able to teach them to make all the sounds required for that, but give them opportunities to explore languages that they don't speak. How would you take that on if one had to learn to say hello or thank you in another language? Or a few lines. Often that happens for an actor that they get cast playing someone who speaks another language. They, they don't have to be indigenous um, to speak another language for a few sentences and then switch into English with an accent. And that's not currently part of my, my teaching, my curriculum that I do, but it's something that my work with indigenous actors has made me think, you know, it really should be. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, I would like to tackle indigenous issues um, first and foremost. I, I've also felt a little bit like I've learned through my research for this project that I'm working on uh, about the idea of decolonizing education. My colonial personal history and the, the sort of settler point of view uh, was very much rooted in my colonial education. And so to question what does a decolonized classroom look like? Uh, how can I bring ways of teaching and learning into my classroom that are different, that are new to me and perhaps more welcoming to Indigenous students? So I participated in a course, a massive online course through the University of British Columbia and uh, uh, an online provider called edX uh, on Indigenous learning. That was one of the most influential aspects of doing this project is that I learned a lot about how one might do that and how you could emphasize aspects of the land, for instance, how one might take the hierarchy out of your training and make it more on a level playing playing field. Uh, having students do as much teaching as the teachers teaching in a way. So it's a, a whole array of things that I've had to take on as a result of exploring this idea. Eric, let me confess to a certain pessimism in this. When I survey the long history of our species, it's hard to find a time when a stronger nation or tribe failed to take advantage of the weaker and certainly here in North America, we know there's been a two or three hundred year concerted effort to commit cultural genocide, if you like. I wonder how optimistic we can permit ourselves to be. Uh, I don't feel like my hopes are unrealistic. Um, I, I hope that things can get better. That's what I hope. I don't believe that we can save all the languages that are at risk. There are hundreds of languages that are at risk of being, um, I don't know, what's the term, Paul, for being destroyed? Well, um, languages go extinct on a daily basis. Extinction, isn't it? Extinction, language extinction. There are attempts being made to preserve those languages so that we have records of them, but I think it's unlikely that at this late stage many of them will be safe forever. But, uh, for instance, uh, in the course of this project, one of the things we're looking at is whether we should document a very dominant language, something like Plains Cree, or something that's really at risk. Uh, Cayuga is a language that is spoken by people quite close to where I live. The latest census data say that there's something like 150 to 250 people who are still um, first language speakers of Cayuga. That is... Uh, very bad news for that language. It, it's unlikely that Cayuga will be around uh, 50 years from now. But to have some documentation of what Cayuga speakers sound like might be a worthwhile thing to preserve. That might be a, a tool that an actor might choose to use to create an accent. Now, so, of course, you, uh, you, you, and, you and I are both um, editors of the International Dialects of English Archive and Part of our privilege and, and joy is to is to record uh, speech donors from around the world and l put them on the archive for preservation and for the instruction of scholars and actors and others. But you and I have both encountered the very natural and very understandable reluctance of Native American indigenous cultures to donate yet another artifact from their own world. What's your, what's been your experience? As part of this project, we're really just getting into the part of get, get heading out and trying to 
to record samples. Part of the problem is around the, that colonial idea of gathering and preserving for someone else. And part of the ethics training for working with indigenous peoples, one of the core concepts is that the materials remain the property of the community from whom it comes. The plan that we are exploring for our project is that the materials will be held by an indigenous theater company in Toronto, Native Earth Performing Arts, and that actors would have access to those materials through Native Earth. That's a way of preserving the materials specifically for indigenous artists. That relationship, a sort of participatory action research model where I'm not researching on doing research on a community, but doing research with a community so that it is their research as much as it is my research is a really uh, important focus shift that has happened in social science and uh, fields like ours in the last probably closer to 20 years that it's really kicked off in a, a meaningful way that uh, these ethical concerns uh, have to be addressed before the research is begun and has to be forefront in the minds of the researchers all the way through the process. So my project was designed with the idea of starting with uh, identifying the needs of the community. What do they feel is needed? What do they want from those identified needs then approaching the community, working with communities to gather materials that can then be analyzed, broken down into helpful component parts that can be then returned to actors from the community, from indigenous backgrounds across Turtle Island, North America. Uh, in the past, uh, researchers would do their work and their work would often end up just on a dusty shelf. No one would have access to it. Now it'll be handed back to the, the people who need it most. Certainly, I don't want actors of a settler background or uh, an immigrant background to try to perform indigenous roles. That's not the point of this. This is creating resources specifically for indigenous artists. How extensive a right does, does an actor of any color or ethnic background have to impersonate and to take on the characteristics, the behavior, the accents, the dialects of other peoples? I know there are some people, I've heard people say that only, only Jews should play Jews, uh, on, only Hasidim should play Hasidim, on, only Native Americans should, you know, and so forth. Where do you come down on that? I don't know. I feel like I'm becoming more confused about matters, to be honest with you, that uh, I, I'm trying to take in the perspectives of many different artists. For instance, there's a community of artists in Toronto who have formed a group on Facebook, and they're all immigrant actors who speak English with a fairly strong accent. And they are trying to advocate for themselves to play characters who speak with their accents rather than uh, mainstream Canadian English actors learning to do their accent. That they are not allowed to play more than secondary characters, it seems. That the leads always go to some big name person who, of course, doesn't have that accent. And they, they are sort of ghettoized, that they can only be secondary or tertiary characters. And their abilities as an artist is never given a chance to shine. So they're, they're trying to advocate for themselves. Part of me sees that and, and feels that there is potentially a, a kind of injustice in uh, that bias that they're confronting. Have I come down on one side or the other? I do think that there are boundaries I don't teach white actors to do black accents. I think that uh, there are boundaries around those who have been oppressed. Maybe it would be the litmus test mm. of when equality has truly been reached, when past wrongs have been righted and the planet is in a more hopeful place. Maybe it's the litmus test of when we could again, as black actors play white, act, white characters and vice versa, without offense, 
uh, without a sense of appropriating cultural property, that that time could could then come. Yeah, I, I think it's a long way off. I think so too. To be honest with you, yeah. The, and the ideas of privilege, I don't imagine that's going away anytime soon. So whether that privilege is around uh, race um, or something else, the process of othering it seems to be a human trait, and I fear that there will be always somebody who has been othered, whose rights need to be upheld and the privileged will need to be sensitive to them. You know, Eric, I've been always struck by the fact that the arts, the performing arts, really have a strong presence in the humanities generally in terms of preserving history, transmitting culture. I'm struck so much by the fact that what I think I know about Northern Ireland comes almost entirely from my experience of Northern Ireland plays and films, that my, my knowledge of English history, you know, comes from Shakespeare, that the arts have this amazing ability to teach the world about itself, which gives us a huge responsibility to tell it right, to, to act ethically about it. You know, we're talking about telling the story of the indigenous peoples and doing justice to it, doing it respectfully as a, as a sacred act. As a, as a privilege. Yeah, I, I, I see it as an opportunity to serve um, the, the stories, that the story is the, the thing that is being served, and uh, that uh, coming together to work with other artists, regardless of their culture, is to tell that story in a humane way that values the experience of the people whose story is being told. Now, I feel like when when one looks back at the stories that were told a hundred years ago, one sees that perspective, the perspective of that culture. So it's so evident. It's so in front of our faces because it's so different from our own experience and our biases, our perspective. We are often so blind to it because we live, we are immersed in our culture that we don't even perceive the bias that is all around us. So, uh, you know, the fact that it's two white guys who are talking about this is so telling of our time and of who we are and the privilege we have. So beginning to work with others, you know, when I went to theater school, all of my peers except for one were mainstream white dominant culture colleagues. Today, my classroom is... Uh, dominated by a diversity that is very refreshing. The kinds of stories that I'm hearing from my students, I just did a unit on storytelling, and the kinds of stories are stories of young people. That's probably the thing that drew them together the most because they're all of the same age. Stories of young people and then stories of family because people, regardless of their cultural background, we tend to have families of one kind or another, and that is at the heart of the human experience. And so as we become more diverse, the things that bring us together are things that are more universal in a way, things that cross cultural boundaries. Even when uh, one of my students was talking about her childhood uh, in fact, her conception in India that her mother was artificially inseminated because her parents were not successful in conceiving. The story was very much based upon her mother's life experience in Mumbai. There were still many, many parallels that cross the differences that divide. And that ultimately is what I think arts are all about, is what what uh, is universal, what draws us together. The culturally specific gives it um, a, a kind of personality. It personalizes it from the, the eye of the storyteller. And uh, for those of us who are fortunate to interpret those stories, that we are not of the culture uh, that originally created that story, then it is our responsibility to bring ourselves fully to that story, our own personality, our own idea of the, the universal, and, of course, marry what we can learn through our research. So language is at the heart of that. How do we embody that language? How do we 
and voice that language. Dialect coach as savior of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a rare responsibility, don't we? To, yeah. do it, to do it right, to bring morality and respect to this job. I mean, I came into the business, as I'm sure you did, with, with a heavy emphasis on normalizing or normativizing people's accents, you know, towards the perceived standard. And that's been under question tremendously in our mm -hmm. lifetime. So we have these twin divergent aims, it seems, to give actors the flexibility to inhabit any character, to take on any set of behaviors with respect, without giving the impression that there is one normative way of behaving or speaking. The, the, and, I mean, the challenge of plurality and diversity is enormous, and it, it's often simplistically expressed and often restrictively re expressed. But if we were to do it right, I think it, mm. it would really change our culture tremendously. Indeed. People who are most critical about speech differences are stodgy old white guys. Um, uh, I frequently am told by older colleagues about speech differences often of younger women, uh, by older white guys. I think there is a, a sense of standards or something that that they grew up with, a sense of this, that this is what is appropriate. And it kind of gets up their nose a little bit that those standards are changing. And so I have to I have to do a little educating sometimes around how language changes and evolves. And they're on, they're on the other side of the mountain. They've gone over the top and they're now coming down the backside. And uh, language has, has already evolved in their lifetime and they're behind the progress of that constantly evolving, changing train that moves forward. In my lifetime, as a Londoner, an amazing accent called multicultural London English has emerged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have no recollection of its warning, the warning shot across the bow that it was coming. And it's extraordinary, it's rich, and it's astonishing that it could have arisen in my lifetime. From what I hear from older people is that we're often surprised by how the language has changed. My perception of it is that as I'm growing up, the, what language is, is out in front of me. It's what my, you know, my role models spoke. But really, language is the thing that your peers speak. It is the thing that you hear around you coming from your friends who are of your age. And as we came up together, that sound, whatever the sound of my peers was, it became dominant. And the, the model of my, my role models started to sound old fashioned. And then creeping up behind me is the sound of the younger folk who are changing the way that people speak. Uh, one example of this is the use of a, a little release of a, a little schwa at the end of an expression. Uh, you sometimes hear this, particularly when people are being very expanse, uh, e e emphatic. They say, Oh no. And this little schwa on the end of it. And it's become very common to, across North America as an emphatic device is to put this little schwa on the end of it. It's similar, perhaps, to the way uh, southern preachers have been characterized uh, as putting this uh, kind of little flourish on the end of a, a, a final vowel or a consonant as a, an emphatic way of like putting a little exclamation point on the end of it. To, and it, I had no idea that this change was happening, but it's, I hear it all the time now. I hear it all the time from my students um, who are right in the pocket of that change. Mostly it's the young women. You know, of course, this kind of change always comes to young women first, apparently, and then it spreads more frequently through the gay community first, and then it spreads uh, to men in general. So we're going to be hearing men... Uh, doing that soon enough all across. And what what I'm waiting for is when presidential candidates will tell us about the United States of America. Uh, I can't, you can't do it on a, <laughs> on a, uh, uh, but uh, to hear that, that uh, in the mouths of politicians, I'm sure it'll happen. Maybe just before I, I die, I'll hear it because uh, it'll take a while to come. 
I, I have been, uh, and many of my colleagues have been employed by politicians on the campaign trail to uh, to use their speech in a, in a way that uh, is appealing to the broadest swath of voters. Often this comes from people being de-patricianized, you know, the old, mm -hmm. yes. the, the, the old standard of being the eloquent statesman-like speaker who embraced rhetoric and spoke eloquently. And those expectations and standards have declined, declined. No, that's judgmental. They've changed. Evolved. Evolved. There's the term. Pinamaya. Pinamaya. Thanks, Eric. Uh, this is a this has been a pleasure. A real pleasure. And it's been too long since we collaborated on something. And to my listeners, thanks for joining me, Paul Meyer, with my guests Eric Armstrong and Sarah Lise MacArthur. Join me again May first, when I will be listening to newscasters on radio and television. The best and the worst. Next time on In a Manner of Speaking.